Unauthorized opinions expressed on the internet would be censored. We are live. We are live. This is real. <laughs> Welcome back to Unauthorized Opinions, uopod.com. Like, share, subscribe. It's pure propaganda and it's super cringe, by the way. I literally went to the polls with nothing in mind. I saw a can of orange soda in the parking lot. <laughs> and it's I was like, yeah, there we go. An unopened can of orange soda just chilling <laughs> in the parking lot. I was like, yeah, I got to vote for Trump, dude. Your podcast sucks it's mental mate it's absolutely mental i'll be honest i thought it was kind of offensive when you talk so much about the loch ness monster political climate and andrew treat yourself okay especially if you start i don't know getting getting in good with homeless people unauthorized opinions streaming everywhere at uopod.com doo <laughs> Welcome back to Unauthorized Opinions, uopod.com. Happy Sunday, happy any day you're listening to this because it's football season and it seems like there's NFL football every single day. So maybe you're watching the night game, maybe it's between afternoon games, maybe it's Monday night or Thursday night or Friday in Brazil, I guess they're doing things now. I wanted to tee up my interview with former WWE wrestler Val Venus and you know what? They say don't meet your heroes, and I'm a guy who watched wrestling growing up as a kid in the Attitude Era, then I watched it for a few years in my adulthood pretty attentively with my friends when I was living with a few of my friends. And they said don't meet your heroes, but Val Venus is about as good as you can hope for one of the guys you used to watch growing up. It's refreshing to hear from a guy who's a professional athlete, you know, top of his class in terms of promotions he was wrestling for, and he's got really well-formed opinions, he's got really thought-out views on government and culture and politics, so it was really a fun time talking to him, and like I said, they say don't meet your heroes, but this went as well as I could have thought. He actually, we actually had to reschedule um, throughout the day when we recorded this because he was caught in some sort of storm, so we actually pulled over to do the interview, which I thought was really nice of him. He didn't want to bail, so he was a good guy, and I'm going to encourage you know, some people that I know to, to have him on because we could have talked for a, a, a couple hours, I felt like, but you don't really want to hold a guy on the side of a road, so he he was game for however long I was game for, but you know, at some point I was like, if, if we keep talking now, we're going to get to like a three or three and a half hour mark. So don't forget to like and subscribe. Go and follow Val's stuff because it's a really interesting conversation we're having about somebody trying to take his trademark out from under him. Uh, We get into some good wrestling stuff. We get into some good uh, stuff around politics and how governments are run. So I really enjoy that portion of the interview. If you like what we're doing here, don't forget to go to the Patreon, patreon.com slash uopod. Bonus content on there. But here is my interview with former WWE wrestler, the big Valbolski, do they call him? And by the way, I forgot for like 90% of the interview that he grew up right down, all not literally, but right down the street from me in the same ballpark here in Ontario. He's a couple of towns over, so that was funny when I remembered that because I was kind of thinking the whole time, is he going to get what I mean when I refer to certain things in Canadian politics? But Val Venus, Unauthorized Opinions. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Share it with your other wrestling bros and all your other friends. Oh, takes us. Val, I appreciate you talking to me. I'm a, I was a big fan in the all throughout the years, and I appreciate you coming on with me. And I guess the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was the reason why I messaged you in the first place to have a chat was there is this claim going on, on out there that somebody had, you know, come out from under you, and I sort of the claim was that they took your your copyright or your basically your claim to the name Val Venus and started releasing things under that name and under that moniker. And can you clear that up if that was true? Because my thinking was, if you have that name, that means you already owned it because, you know, the powers that be, let's call them, from yesteryear definitely wouldn't have let you have that name or maybe I'm wrong about that. Can you clear that up for everybody? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, Just based on some of my political positions, you know, you you tend to garner a lot of hatred, uh, really. There's no other real way to describe it accurately other than you just, you garner a lot of hatred. And so 
Um, there was apparently a guy named Matt Kuhn who was, uh, I don't know if he's a musician, but he's, he's far left, completely bonker, liberal kind of guy. And some guy from France, uh, he goes by the, uh, I guess he's on Twitter is hang him high or something like that. And, uh, so I'm not sure exactly how they got together. Uh, but Matt Kuhn bought the valvenus.com, uh, domain which didn't really matter to me at first anyway I, I had really no real interest in in having that domain but when he started to use that domain and publish it online as if it's something that i stand behind which was the lgbtq community he decided to use the val venus domain to forward it to uh a i guess some kind of trevor project or something similar to that an organization that supports the lgbtq community which is something i'm against and so th that's really what kind of piqued my interest into what's going on here and then there was a guy from france that goes by i guess i think it's hang em high i could be wrong uh, i'm pretty sure that's the name um he decides he's going to hold a fundraiser because he noticed that the Val Venus trademark uh, was in 2007, I believe it was, WWE attempted to trademark the name Val Venus. Well, at that point in time, I had already been using it for about eight years in commerce. So common law establishes that in order for them to get the uh, trademark into their name, the WWE name, uh, they would need my permission. And the examining attorney at the trademark patent office uh, wrote back and forth with the attorney for WWE. And they were trying to debate the issue of whether WWE should have it without my signature. And the examining attorney said, you got to get this guy's signature. He's been using it for eight years. And I would have willingly signed it over to him if we could come to a good uh, deal on my end as well. And I guess, you know, WWE at some point decided, ah, maybe we're just going to let this one sit out. And they abandoned their attempts. I guess they went through all their appeals, but eventually they were forced to abandon their attempt to trademark the WWE name without my signature. Um, so fast forward to uh, today, and I guess it was just a few months ago, and this guy in France that despises my political positions and therefore uh, it goes further than that for liberals, right? They hate the person, not just the political positions the person holds, but the person themselves. And they hated me so much, he decided to hold a fundraiser and uh, decided to attempt to get the Val Venus name trademarked for him. And you know, they made some acronym about how it's going to stand for value added for the transgender community. I, I don't know exactly what the acronym stood for, but they have it listed out and they forward it to a site that they created around that acronym. And uh, so they have filed for the trademark, uh, but uh, they're, they're going to run into the exact same thing. Common law states, I've been using this name since 1998 in commerce. And it's, uh, it's by common law, it's my name. Now, a lot of people will ask me, why didn't you go trademark it? Well, I am a true to my heart, God fearing anarchist. I have no use for the state whatsoever. And the last thing I'm going to do, especially because we have common law rights that we can prove in court. It's not like I have to, you know, dig up some evidence to prove I've been using the name since 1998. I've been using the name since 1998. It's everywhere. And so uh, just relying on true anarchist principles, uh, common law rules the day. It ruled the day when WWE attempted to trademark the name. And it's going to rule the day, uh, of course, as this hang em high character uh, thinks he's going to usurp the name Val Venus and trademark it with a government agency. So that's basically about the rundown there. Yeah, that is an incredible amount of effort done by those people because, uh, 
you know, to go after somebody that they just don't like. That's a lot of free time being used that, you know, we could argue could be used for better means. What was it that stood out to them that made you a huge enemy in their eyes? Because we know the mob will come after uh, people for very uh, insignificant statements or significant ones is, as long as it's seen by, you know, the right person to, to freak out about it. Was there one particular thing that you said that got these people angry, the, you know... The, basically, I know the, tr the Trevor Project is transgender supporting, of course. What got these people so angry with you? Well, I think it started back when AEW had hired uh, another, I guess, male wrestler pretending to be a female wrestler in Nyla Rose. Um, and so when I saw this happen, you know, I, as a wrestler, a storyteller, I could see the hiring of a transgender used in a, in a, in a responsible way. I mean, to, to create it as an oddity. I mean, th there's some, definitely some storytelling. Your wrestling is about telling stories that can be by the fans can be related to because the stories that are being told in the wrestling ring are just amplified stories of what's happening in real life. And so, uh, you know, bringing a transgender in there, you've got I mean, storylines written in there based on real life. You have somebody with a mental disorder called gender dysphoria. Um, and you can see what's happening in real life is that schools, parents are, are suing schools uh, because they're, the school districts are allowing males to compete with their female daughters in track and field and, and other high school sports and college sports. So you could easily take a wrestling storyline and wrap it around something that's happening in real life like that and, and make it make sense. But AEW decided to bring Nyla Rose in as a transgender, but we're going to talk about Nyla Rose as she as as he's wrestling women like nyla rose was just born a woman and it's totally normal and i think you know entertainment is is incredibly powerful uh, when it comes to grabbing on to the minds especially of young people but people of all ages you know entertainment is a powerful medium and i think they're you know should be used a lot more responsibly than it is today and they they basically presented nyla rose as just a you know a biological female wrestling with uh, other females. So I took I took you know notice of that, and I went online and I basically said, you know, here's Tony Khan, president of AEW, along with Cody Rhodes, who I guess helps Tony Khan found AEW, and they're not using Nyla Rose to reflect you know stories that are happening in real life. In instead, they decided to use their entertainment platform to normalize the idea that a man can become a woman and compete with women and no problems we'll give her the championship we won't we won't tell storylines of you know the women screaming and yelling this isn't fair which is what you how you would write a storyline that's reflecting real stories going on in real life but they didn't do any of that they decided to use their platform to normalize the acceptance of the lgbtq community and their mental disorders where a man can go in and wrestle a female as if he's just a biological female just a, another one of the ladies so i took issue with that and that really got the lgbt community uh slash wrestling fan community uh really really panties up in a bunch and they came after me hard and that's what really started it all and of course, I'm not really one to back down from my political positions. I'm absolutely always open to, you know, listening to other people's so-called facts, but I'm not just going to accept their facts for what they say those facts are. I'm going to critically take a look at whatever evidence they're presenting that would, you know, maybe change my positions. I, I'm willing to change my positions if the facts dictate that my position should be changed. But these people don't come with any facts whatsoever. Uh, anything they, they argue is based on feeling and emotion. And you just start asking rational questions. And instead of engaging and answering questions where we can go down that learning path, so to speak, they, they don't want anything to do with that. They immediately call you a transphobe, a racist, a bigot. And the next thing you know, they're so mad 
that they'll take a look at. Oh, look at this trademark, Val Venus. It was abandoned. That means we can get it. Screw Val Venus. And that's basically what kicked it all off was me speaking out about uh, the way AEW was using Nyla Rose, um, basically joining in on the uh, what I call the communist propaganda to destroy the minds of, of young Americans. What's really interesting about that to me, Val, is that Cody Rhodes, of course, his brother, played Gold Dust for so many years. But, but yeah. with Gold Dust, he was a, I'm going to say, a traditional transvestite where he was treated. I forget the, what they would always refer to him as. I forget the term. And in fact, I was watching a video of, of one of his interviews the other day, but I forget what they always referred to him as. But, you know, he was always creeping on other men. He had the wig, but he was also this giant wrestler with a great family lineage and he was a great wrestler well into his 50s as well so i think that's a little interesting that they that his brother now is going down that road but i wanted to bring up the fact that what i saw months ago maybe it was last year whenever it was was that cody rhodes was posing with a child holding a trans flag like on on the ramp on the way to the ring and i thought that was really strange i thought that was completely inappropriate and you're basically teaching these kids, you know, that there is no difference here between fantasy and reality. And you can argue that that's the goal sometimes in wrestling. But at the same time, you're teaching children literally now by putting this person in the ring against women that there is no difference, even in sport. And we saw this at the Olympics as well with the the people who have male chromosomes like that. Are, they're literally just men. <laughs> Um, fighting women, the two of them, allegedly, of course, and now, and and now you have them in uh, AEW, and Cody Rhodes is going around promoting it, and and like you said, there's a man wrestling a woman or women, and being treated as if it's just you know a, a great female wrestler, probably stronger than. Uh, Charlotte Flair, who I would deem to be one of the best female wrestlers of all time, and probably could beat the crap out of her and any other female wrestler if they actually wanted to. I would, I don't know, you tell me how dangerous it would be because there weren't really ever female versus male uh, matches, intergender matches in history, except for the last few years. I think obviously a lot more places have experimented with it. But when you... Um, you know, let's go back to the late 90s or early 2000s, if you will. Was there any ever ever any discussion around this topic as to whether or not men and women should be wrestling in, in the same divisions and not just as, like, a gimmick match? No, th there was no talk of that whatsoever. Whenever you had, like, I wrestled China um, in the past a couple of times, actually, and it was... The, the story was China was this oddity of a woman. You know, China wasn't pretending to be something she wasn't. She was an oddity of a woman. She was a very strong, powerful woman. And even, even in the storyline, you know, we would lock up. I'd push her to the corner, and I'd close that fist and wind it up. And I just can't hit a woman. And the next thing you know, she slaps me across the face, and we're off to the races. Um, so th there was always... Like I said, storylines that would reflect what happens in real life that is just amplified in the ring. Um, but now it's 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 not so much like that. It's um, we're going to produce entertainment content uh, content that's not going to offend anybody. We're going to do this uh, transgender. Uh, idea coming into a transgender woman coming into wrestle biological woman women and we're gonna talk about and it's weird because you hear the color commentators talking about nyla rose performing in the ring like nyla rose was just another biological female and in that sense it normalizes the idea that men can just pretend to be women and and wrestle and, and compete against women and i think that's a bad path to go down um i think it's a very irresponsible use of entertainment um is they're engaging in social engineering rather than entertainment because if they were engaged in entertainment there's lots of storylines real life storylines of 
the transgender movement being accepted into school boards, the school boards getting sued for allowing transgenders to, to compete against their sons and daughters, or I guess in this case, it would be daughters. And uh, there's lots of storylines that you could piggyback off of that and really amplify, but they chose not to do that. Um, instead, they chose to become propagandist, engage in social engineering. And, you know, it, it's one TV show. It's, it's an AEW pro wrestling show on TV. You can say, oh, it's just one show and it, it doesn't really mean much, but it's, it's one show. It's one movie. It's one sitcom. It's just society being bombarded with entertainment that is being used for social engineering. And it's sad to see professional wrestling go down that path in some cases and engage in that same kind of behavior. The argument of what I call the why do you even care argument is one that I think is just born out of laziness and fear to not actually want to have the conversation. I want to ask you, do you think the WWE will go down the same path without Vince McMahon in, in the way who's sort of, you know, of course, you know better than I do, but, but uh, you know, held the reins in there for a long time. But do you think the new management would be open to some something like that? Is it still Triple H uh, running it now? I haven't watched probably since like 2019. Yeah, I haven't watched uh, very much WWE content in several years now. I catch it a little clips here and there while I'm doing cardio every morning. But um, I believe that Triple H is basically... Uh, chief of content or I'm not sure what position he has there, but he's definitely uh, high up the ladder. Um, you know, when you take a look at trying to predict where WWE is going to go going forward, I mean, that's a rabbit hole to go down now that WWE is owned and controlled by TKO. Uh, when you take a look at the executive players uh, for that company that also run the UFC, um, you could definitely come to some predictions that they they may start getting involved with the DEI, um, the, the whole DEI movement. A lot of corporations have, uh, I guess, been persuaded to adopt these DEI propaganda to really push into their own companies. Um, we've seen that happen from Bud Light to Harley Davidson. I guess Ford now is backing away from that. Um, you know, it's, these people are really, really trying to change society. And I'm not saying that, you know, Tony Khan knows that he's doing that. I think Tony Khan has been, uh, you know, propagandized uh, like a lot of other people. And Tony Khan's a guy that might look at business and he likes and he, he loves wrestling and he's combining the two. And that's what he's focusing on. And, you know, he's just uh, I don't think he realizes he's engaging in social engineering. I think he's been conditioned to engage in social engineering without really realizing that he's engaging in social engineering. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this interview. It is brought to you by the sponsor of today, which is me, <laughs> patreon.com slash UOPod. Sign up for one of our tiers. You can sign up for our basic package, which basically is just to support us and help us become Joe Rogan. You can also become one of our super fans, like the Raptors super fan who can somehow afford to go to every Toronto Raptors home game for all of time. I think that goes back to 95. Or you can become an unauthorized person where you can suggest topics or videos, and we will cover them when we have before. That's patreon.com slash uopod. Get bonus interviews, bonus podcasts, and of course, advance notice on videos that we've done we've had some bonus interviews on there for a few weeks check them out and we're going to get to some more stuff in the near future with some hockey bros some guys in the nhl you won't want to miss it uopod.com or patreon.com slash uopod for from my perspective when it gets to that that big things do get out of control with the people under you and i pretty much um a lot of the time when i'm looking at these things i'm saying who, who is coming up with these plans? Who is marketing this stuff? And I can't help but think that there is a lot of, you know, things being left to the 24-year-old marketing agent or the or the girl with the, the political science degree. And I think in the, in the past, the last maybe like 50 years, 30 years, nothing's got it, gone that far out of control. But now you sort of have to, as a company, I think, completely clamp down and make sure you're not making too many political statements 
which which I thought would have been the norm, but now a lot of these people think that it's, you know, the justice and their duty to do something like this. And I was trying to trying to remember which team in the NFL has the, the transgender cheerleaders, and it's the Panthers. I, I thought it might be the Jaguars, which would have been the Khan family, but I think they just have, you know, uh, some male cheerleaders on, on their team, which is a thing in itself. I don't know who that's for, but um, things, are de- th- things are definitely out of control across the board. Now, let me ask you, people, are, people like to make the argument that things were you know, always the same, and in particular, I think of when people say, oh, there's never been women in these shows or in these sports, or there's never been black people in these movies and everything, and you're going to have to correct them. But when you were, uh, let, let's go with the Attitude Era, was there any pushback against your character being based, I don't know if the, the, the notes in the back room said porn star, <laughs> basically, was there any, was there any like attack? Were there the the religious groups that people would talk about on TV? Was there any pushback for your character, even though it was in a sea of many characters who were edgy at the time? Yeah, you know there, there was some pushback. We had the Parental Television Council um, that really went after WWE's advertisers and had an effect had so much of an effect that Vince decided he wanted to take the two most controversial characters being Godfather and my character, the Val Venus character and become the RTC, the right to censor right. for, for which we would mock the PTC uh, as the RTC. So yeah, there, there was definitely some pushback. Um, but you know, this was during a time where th- this was shocking. It was entertaining and you know we were geared more towards 14 and up we weren't necessarily geared towards children uh you know godfather and the val venus segments would generally be in the second hour of the show so and, and they never really referred to the val venus character as a former porn star uh anywhere in wwe they always referred to val venus as the former adult film star which <laughs> doesn't really make too much of a difference but uh, they'd always be sure to use the word adult film uh, star rather than porn star. But that didn't stop, you know, the wrestling community from, you know, themselves saying that it's a porn star character. That's so interesting. I did. I didn't. I guess I was too young to put it together that that was making fun of those groups. Uh, right to censor. That was a good time as well. Uh, what do you? aligning with these days you, you describe yourself as a like a pure anarchist in the purest sense are you aligning with anyone politically do you feel the need um to to speak out against one party or the other or do you you know you've been around longer than i have you've probably been you know aware of the corruption of politics and and just through business alone you see the politics are you one of the or are you the type to you know, think that both sides are basically working towards the end goal with some exceptions, or are you, you, do you lean towards more a libertarian or Republican or populist sort of thing? No, I'm a true God-fearing anarchist. You know, I, I follow Jesus Christ, and uh, I have no use for the state. I think the entire platform called government is a platform for criminals to perform the criminal acts uh, upon. And it's uh you know we could go to you know everybody says the old cliche taxation is theft and it sounds good and people say it all the time but taxation is theft theft is a crime and you know when you come down to it you know i take a look at it people you know can only morally and ethically vote to delegate rights to people they want to represent them they can only delegate rights that they have themselves well, I don't have a right to steal from you. I don't have a right to use intimidation, coercion, or force to compel you to pay me money for any reason. So if I don't have that right to do it myself directly to you, then it also stands to reason I don't have a right to vote someone into power and delegate a right I don't have onto the person I vote for to steal from you. It, it doesn't, there's no point in time anywhere along that line uh, where a right to steal from you just magically appears. And when I start thinking about the, the very minute details of what really takes place along that line of delegating a right I don't have onto somebody that's going to exercise that right upon you and compel you to pay them money on my behalf, 
there, there's no point in time along that line that the right just magically becomes a right. And so where does the right come from? Well, if you were to go to court and the judge who's supposed to be fair and impartial, if the judge says, hey, you're, you violated these tax laws, um, and so now we're charging you. Well, who's charging me? Is it the judge or is it the prosecutor? It's the prosecutor. So the judge has to remain fair and impartial. And it stands to reason that if the prosecutor is claiming that you violated tax laws, then he's also claiming that you're obligated to obey those tax laws. Well, okay, let's examine that. I mean, it's easy to say I'm obligated to obey. I've had my teachers tell me my whole life that I'm obligated to obey. I've had my parents tell me that I'm obligated to obey. I've had the news media tell me I'm obligated to obey. I've had all Hollywood portray the idea that we're all obligated to obey. But never once in my entire life have I seen one single shred of evidence that would prove I'm obligated to obey those written instruments called tax laws. So you could theoretically go into court and say, I'm demanding to challenge the claim that I'm obligated to obey because when a prosecutor pulls you into court, he's claiming you violated the law. So he's also claiming you're obligated to obey that law. And you as a human have a human right to challenge any claims made against you. And it stands to reason that if he's claiming that you violated the law, then he's clearly claiming you're obligated to obey that law. And you have a human right to challenge that foundational claim. And the reality is the government will go ahead and say it's created in the legislature. People are voted in. They create the law. They vote on the law and the law it becomes you're obligated to obey this law. Well, you're telling me how the law is created. Nobody's denying how the laws are created. I understand how the laws are created. I'm not challenging how the laws are created. And then he'll go into, you know, the the laws are for social order and for to have everybody pay their fair share. And okay, I understand the intent of the law. I'm not challenging the intent of the law. I'm challenging the idea that I'm obligated to obey it. And the prosecution ultimately, when it comes down to it, is the law applies because the law itself says it applies. Well, that's circular logic. That's a logical fallacy. I mean, what court in the world would accept a logical fallacy as proof that I'm obligated to obey their written instrument called tra or tax laws? It doesn't. So there's no evidence at all. So where does the authority come from? Well, when you examine all those minute details and you find out that in reality, they have no evidence. It comes from the barrel of government's guns. That's where the obligation comes from. They will point their guns at you and use intimidation, coercion, and force to compel you to pay. But then you can examine that particular uh, argument again and break it down even further. It stands to reason that you can use the barrel of a gun to enforce the obligation or you can to, to force compliance with the law, but you can't use the barrel of a gun to create an obligation to obey the law. You first have to prove the obligation actually exists to obey the law before you can use a gun to enforce that law. Does it, like That stands to reason in my mind, and, and I have a very broken free from the system mindset now. And I have since I was 45 years old, I was a libertarian before that, still on my journey. And I, when I finally landed on this idea that, you know, in court, it, it, there's a good opportunity to really have Americans fight this ridiculous idea that we're obligated to obey these tax laws. And uh, I can't see any other reasonable arguments that the prosecutor could make uh, where he could prove the obligation to obey is valid with facts with facts that are valid facts, not circular logic or logical fallacies. And so um, I look at these laws as, uh, you know, incompatible with freedom, incompatible with liberty. And I think these laws enslave people. And it's not just tax laws. I think they're gun control laws, drug laws. Um, you know, I think there's, you can inject morality into all this as well. But I think for the most part, we have way too many laws. When you get above common law, which is just natural universal law, we know what's right, we know what's wrong, and that's it. Murder is wrong. Rape is wrong. But Paying 55% of your paycheck to a government that sends bombs overseas to kill people, that's not logical to me. 
um, you know, paying money to ship people, criminals from Venezuelan jails, Ecuadorian jails into the United States on my dime that I have to pay for. That's not logical to me. Um, even when you go to, hey, you better pay to fix this pothole. My mindset is that program to fix a pothole is a good idea. We should have a fundraiser for it. I think all government programs should be based on voluntary fundraisers and not uh, this extortion racket that they call taxation. Yeah, I want to expand on your last point there because this is a conversation I've had with my friends in the past. And, I, and I'll get back to what you're saying in a second because I do think your logic makes sense and I do think that most, if not all of this, is based on the assumption that you will comply or else the guns will be drawn on you. Now, something I do talk about with my friends often is this idea of me deciding where my money is supposed to go. And I do tend to logically come to the conclusion that you have uh, come to here, where it's, why do I not get to decide where my taxation goes to, at least to some degree? You know, my friend who's in the medical industry will say, well, don't you want ambulances? And I'm like, well, I... Like, in the United States, they don't have government, uh, you know, sanctioned health care, which is done by uh, taxation. But up here in Canada, it's automatically taken from you no matter how much you use it. So as a person who's never been a hospital patient, will knock on wood for that one, I think that my uh, the amount that I have paid into the system does not equal the amount I've gotten out of the system. I think there should be an insurance option. And I've even argued down to the fact that, you know, like, I would be okay with there being different you know, toll roads, you got your shitty road here, you got your medium road here. I mean, I think there is room for people to make decisions um, on their own as to where their money goes to, especially when we're taxed at the levels that we do. I think there is, uh, you know, a need for this moving forward in our society because, you know, who am I fo forced to vote for, especially up here in Canada? We've got a conservative party that I don't think is very conservative at all. And I'm not some sort of hardcore, you know, fundamental conservative. I'm a person that just has, you know, beliefs and thinks that they should be... It's very simple. Uh, just don't import tons of immigrants. Don't have t a high taxation levels. Don't go crazy with gender stuff. I have pretty simple things that I think are easy to follow for a government. But I can't trust in that. I can't get that from any of the political parties up here. So why can't I decide, at least for a whole bevy of things, what my money goes into. I understand if you want to keep the roads, uh, you know, functioning. I understand that you want to have... I would even, you know, secede to the healthcare argument in Canada if it meant I could choose if my money went to certain other things. And that much, I think, we very much agree on. What I wanted to ask you um, on your beliefs is to what level do you think this is actually possible especially in terms of a federal government and a military are you thinking more of you know just uh you know logically speaking if nobody was was in this practice of having a government there wouldn't be some sort of giant uh, uh federal army you know the chinese army the the united states military do you think that there would be uh that would exist at all or would there we be in sort of um what's the word i'm looking for uh Know, or so somebody makes their own army help me out here a militia type yeah, situation militia, fu militia, funded yeah. funded militaries would that be the situation we're dealing with and is that better than having you know a, a federal government to fight on your behalf how far do you think that can go do you think that there needs to be some sort of basis for uh country a country defense or, or you know anything like that the department of homeland security well, it's a, it's a good question. I think the fundamentals, in order for a country to really have a government-free, in order to have a government-free nation, the fundamentals of society must be embraced, nurtured, and then deeply rooted into the grounds, into the hollow grounds of your nation. And so uh, when I take a look at that, I would love to see a society go back to the day where you know, guns were completely normal. Families had guns. You had guns in the back of the pickup truck window, people carrying pistols on their on their hips uh, on a regular basis. I mean, if you had a society that was rooted in, in Christian ideology, uh, the the really and I'm not saying, you know, when I say that it gets a lot of the people on the left all. Oh, he just wants to be, I mean, I'm not talking about the type of Christian ideology where, you know, we're out in the street and we're 
protesting every little thing that, that you know, a deeply rooted Christian church would not like. Like West, what was that? West Baptist? Uh, Westboro Baptist Church, Baptist Baptist, yeah, like those people are, you know, they're they want to fight people rather than uh, extol the message of Jesus Christ. So if we get back to a very basic Christian country where uh, we have common law, we have an armed society, guns are completely normal. You get rid of taxation. There's two things you got to do that would change society drastically for the better you got to get rid of all taxation you got to call taxation what it is it's a state sanctioned extortion racket that's got to go uh, and at the same time you got to get rid of the central banks you got to get rid of the central banks and their fiat currency scam where they just counterfeit the currency out of thin air thus stealing the value that we all create getting up and going to work for 40 50 60 70 80 hours a week that value we're creating while we're working, we tokenize that value into fiat currency, and then the central bankers just counterfeit it. They call it inflation when the prices go up, but we know what it really is. The dollars we've already done did work for the value of our work, our labor, our skills, and our talents, our time, and our efforts are being stolen out of the dollar bills we already worked for, and of course, evenly distributed into the new bills they just print out of thin air. It's the biggest scam on the face of the earth, and between the extortion racket called taxation and the counterfeiting racket that the central banker that the central bankers engage in, it leaves American families. With no time to be families, tight knit families, where God can be the centerpiece of that family. You have, we forced literally for stealing so much value from the laborers, the, the people that engage in the American economy or the Canadian economy. We've stolen so much value from them their entire life in the form of taxation and counterfeiting that now the wife is forced to go out and get a full-time job. Uh, you see inflation where housing prices go higher and higher. Well, really, the value of the dollar goes lower and lower. The value of the house stays the same. It, the, you know, the numbers, the price numbers may appear to look up, but that house only, only maintains a certain amount of value. It's the dollar's value that's being stolen from it, from the central banker's counterfeiting racket. So you're stealing so much from the American family that families eventually are stressed financially, which leads into more divorces. You get higher divorce rates. You have uh, more children that don't have a father in the home or don't have a mother in the home. You, you slowly break down society. And at the same time, you have government saying, we're going to disarm everybody. Uh, we're here for your safety. Give us your guns. And you have uh, government trying to condition people to start questioning kids. They're trying to condition kids to question their own gender and to uh, how to break away from your family if they won't let you transition or call you by the right pronouns. It's a complete attack on the God's purpose for mankind, which is the nuclear family and be fruitful. And the attacks on the nuclear family are what destroy societies. So you get rid of the extortion racket, the state sanctioned extortion racket we call taxation. You get rid of the world's most powerful above the law counterfeiting racket, the counterfeiting cartel, in this case in America, it's the Federal Reserve. Get rid of that. So you completely, you're making the, you're making the value of labor great again to the point where your labor creates so much value that you are now allowed to remain in possession of that you no longer need your wife out to get that second job where you're pulling the family apart. You can afford to put your kid in hockey, jujitsu, skiing. You can afford those vacations as a family. You can afford to travel where you, where you want with your family to get together with other family members. Society becomes closer knit. And when society becomes closer knit and they become armed, you have a complete society rooted in God. The nuclear family is protected and nurtured. People are armed to the teeth. Ain't nobody even going to think about invading that society. Nobody, not there is a, a country anywhere in the world. There's no government in the world that could invade a society so deeply rooted in God and armed to the teeth. You wouldn't need a standing army. You might have, you know, groups getting together to defend communities and things of that nature, but nobody's going to, uh, no government 
uh, in their right mind is going to attempt to invade a country where the people are armed to the teeth and their ideology is rooted in common law, universal God's law. Reminds me of the movie, I think, Red Dawn, the remake where they have the North Koreans try to invade. Yeah, there's a lot of problems with trying to invade a place where people are fully armed. And that's why I think there's a difference in the lockdowns um, in the United States versus Canada and Australia, where Australia, they were literally put into camps uh, where they weren't allowed to leave. And Canada was little hotel rooms where they kind of forced people to go into, but they also did force some people in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> what was I going to ask based off of that? Right. Um, what would you say was the first thing you watched or type of thing that you read or consumed that started making you question things a little bit? And I'll preface it as going far back. I don't know if you remember the, the documentary called Zeitgeist. That was a big yes. one probably in like 2007. And that was about the yep. same time where Alex Jones, I think, was becoming popular in a lot of circles. And then, of course, the Rogan podcast made me think about aliens and religion and everything. Was there one thing you sort of remember, whether it was in, in this generation or the last, that, that made you really start to think, i got to start thinking about how the world works a little bit more closely? Yeah, mine actually got started when I was 17 years old. Um, you know, being raised in Canada myself, um, you know, you think taxation is completely normal. You think uh, universal health care is completely normal. He, I, it was, these were political things that I had no interest in really thinking deeply about. And, you know, you grow up as a kid. The only thing I wanted to do was wrestle, motocross and ski. And um, so but I also was very interested in making as much money as I could. And so I, I was a, you know, I was a hard worker when I was a teenager. I would hay bale all summer long, uh, which is just super hard work. Uh, but you got paid really, really well. And by the time, you know, the summer ended, I had worked the entire summer and didn't have time to do, spend it. So the summer would end and I would start school with a boatload of cash. Well, when summer ended and I was done hay baling, there was fall time. And so I was on my parents' roof uh, cleaning out the eaves troughs. This is going back in grade nine. And I was cleaning out the eaves troughs. And the neighbor came out and he looks up at me on the roof and he goes, Hey, Sean, when you're done your parents' house, why don't you come over to my house and I'll pay you $50 if you clean out my eaves troughs. And I stopped and I looked. And back then, $50 was a lot of money. And so... I looked around and I went, this guy's going to pay me 50 bucks to clean out his eavesdrops. Hell yeah. So I finished up my parents and I immediately grabbed my ladder, carried it over to my neighbors. And, uh, you know, it took me about, I think it was 30, 40, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe to clean out his eavesdrops and, um, paid me 50 bucks. And then I got to thinking, hell, I could really do this for some, you know, good money on the weekends. So during the fall time, after school, I would go knock on doors and I would try to fill up from 8.30 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night cleaning people's eaves troughs. And uh, so by the time, you know, Wednesday or Thursday would roll around, I'd be going out every night after work just knocking on people's doors. And I would have the entire weekend, Saturday and Sunday, filled up with people that wanted their eaves troughs cleaned. So I started cleaning these troughs and I was banking on that. Like I was making some good money. It's just a kid with a ladder and a scoop and some garbage bags. That's all it is, making money. And so this went on for grade nine, grade 10, and in grade 11, I was giving receipts to the people that paid me to clean their eaves troughs. And I just called it Morley's Eaves Trough Cleaning Company. And I didn't have it registered as a business or any of that. It was just me making money. And so, well, Revenue Canada came knocking. And I don't know um, specifically which customers tried to write off their uh, ease trough cleaning business, but Revenue Canada apparently uh, took notice of the receipts that I was giving out and they came and paid me a visit. And so ultimately, uh, you know, they did, they ran numbers. Uh, they took basically a guess of how much money I made in the first two years of doing that, uh, the first two fall seasons. And uh, it ended up, you know, almost being a little over $3,000. It was like almost $3,200. I had to pay them in the last season. So in grade 12, uh, that fall, all my East Trough cleaning money went to Revenue Canada, which is like the IRS. 
and something didn't sit right. I was, I was uber angry about it. Um, I had people telling me that it's the taxes. You have to pay your taxes. It's your civic duty. And my parents were saying the same thing. Hey, that's what you get. You got to pay those taxes. But no matter how many times my parents told me that, or my neighbors told me that, or my friends told me that, something didn't sit right, did not feel right. The government didn't come and knock on those doors every day after school. The government didn't climb that ladder on these sloped roofs that I could have easily have fallen off of and hurt myself. The government didn't scoop out all those leaves and then wash out the troughs. The government didn't haul away all the, all the leaves and stuff that I would remove from the, tr from the, uh, from the troughs. I did all that. So something didn't sit right with me here. And it, that really is where I, I started looking into, okay, I don't hear the Liberal Party or the Conservative Party talking about um, the evils of this taxation, because no matter how many times people say it's your civic duty, to me, in my gut, I just felt this was evil. And so I found, you know, through doing research and, and, you know, looking for who else would agree with me, I found there was a political party that I never heard of before called the Canadian Libertarian Party. And they basically held that same belief. So now I didn't feel alone. And so I really started looking into libertarianism and I started studying conservative economics. Um, and so I, I slowly went from what I would say if you were to ask me what I was coming out of high school, you could say I was a socialist. I believed in universal health care. I believed in taxation, all those things. You could say I, I held socialist beliefs, but I wouldn't have known what socialism meant uh, back then. Um, but when I started to learn about libertarianism and started to read everything I could get my, my hands on, uh, I became much more conservative economically. And, uh, so I, I kind of landed into what I would say conservative libertarian, uh, I guess, beliefs for a good, you know, probably till I was probably about 23, 24. Then I just went full on libertarian. But I kept, I kept reading. I kept studying. I kept thinking about these issues. And I became more and more libertarian as the years went on. And then I found a man by the name of Lysander Spooner. And when I read his work, because there was something about the Libertarian Party that still had that very slight tinge of statism. And in my mind, it's a necessary evil because that's how my mind was conditioned. It's a necessary, government is a necessary evil. We can make it small, but it's a necessary evil. But what didn't sit right with me is if you make it small today, because you vote the right people into power, the roots of that government platform are still ingrained into American soil or Canadian soil. So it still didn't sit right with me. And then I found a man by the name of Lysander Spooner, which changed my whole perspective. I was about 44, 45 years old at that point. And that's when I kind of fell off the libertarian platform and landed to where I am now. And uh, that's straight up anarchy. Um, an anarchist community is probably going to be your most polite community. People are armed to the teeth. You know, people say you can't be an anarchist if you believe in Jesus Christ. Well, I believe that you cannot be an effective uh, anarchist without Jesus Christ. And so, you know, I call myself uh, the most, I guess the most accurate way you could describe my political positions is as a God fearing anarchist. I forgot, Val, that you were from around here. Where did you go to high school? I'm from Oshawa. <laughs> so I went to high school uh, for a few years up in Richmond Hill. Uh, okay. it, was called, it, was, uh, it was called Donhead Secondary School. And then I went to Markham District High School for a few okay. years after that. Yeah, I forgot that you were from this area. It's, uh, it's wild. I should have just, I could have been, I thought I had to explain the Canadian system and everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. You'd be um, probably about like 30 minutes away from where I am right now without giving away my exact location. I wish I could be in Arizona or Texas or something uh, like you are. Um, I want to ask you before you go, just so I can uh, pop something up at the end of the podcast or something, what would you say is your favorite Val Venus bit um, that you can remember just being like the most, let's go with most ridiculous one. 
the most ridiculous one was when I came out with that um, flesh colored super squirter, the super squirter gun. And it was flesh colored. <laughs> and, I, and I was shooting milk out of it and shooting milk at all the, at some of the female uh, wrestlers and the male wrestlers. And it was, uh, yeah, that was um, when they showed that to me, I'm looking at it going, you got to be kidding me. And they're like, that's what you're doing tonight. I went, all right, let's do this. Um, and I felt ridiculous doing it. But it was also, you know, back then it was uh, you're catering to the college crowd. And it it was funny. The pe- people were laughing at it. It was a uh, good time was had by all. Yeah, and you're fighting for airtime. I mean, you've got only a couple hours um, on Monday and I guess maybe Thursday at the time, if I'm remembering correctly. And you're competing with with the WCW, so you have to keep raising the bar is how I would see it. And another quick thing I wanted to ask was, um, was everything, like, sponsored, like, when they bring out the Budweiser truck and whatever it might be, the, I don't know if, if it was um, Miller Lite or Bud Light or something, when Stone Cold sprays or anything, it was all the integration back then done with corporate sponsor approval, or was it because it was a live event that they can't do anything about it? The same way you wouldn't be able to do anything about, you know, somebody playing music that's copywritten at a live event. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd be the wrong person to ask about that. I know some stuff, obviously, they had sponsors for, which was part of the reason they turned Godfather and I into the RTC, because the PTC was, you know, really doing some damage when it came to WWE sponsors at the time. So I'm sure there was a lot of sponsorship involved throughout the show. I mean, they're a corporation of business. They're going to try and monetize everything they possibly can. So I'm sure any time that they could monetize, you know, a, a beer spot on the show or a soda spot on the show or, uh, you know, th- they'll definitely do that. Yeah. But I, I can't say for sure what was monetized and what was not monetized. For sure. I get that. Uh, no, uh, no towel sponsor. I'm taking it. Uh, well, <laughs> <be> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no towel sponsors. Um, that that would have been nice to have, but yeah, no towel sponsors. They were all my towels. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate you talking to me. I'd love to do this again. Uh, I'd love uh, to do it in person if you're ever back up in this area. Is there anything else you want to say before I let you go? Yeah, follow me on uh, on the X platform. It's uh, Val Venus Ent. It's the same Val Venus ENT on Instagram as well, and on Gab, same uh, same handle Val Venus ENT. All right, I appreciate you. Have a good night, okay? Turn it up, Jordan.